Andy was a big guy, 0'6'4", 6'5", or something like that, and probably 220. Despite his great size, he was an incredibly sweet and caring individual. He generally had a big honking smile and loved to show it off. He played football in high school all four years. But Andy, for various reasons, I think, saw fire through me as a way to make money in the summer, and then he was planning to go to school in Montana and Missoula, but um, obviously didn't make it. And their assignment was to cut trees on a ridge line. And one of those trees that they cut, they had a massive set of problems with. It was likely way outside the scope of their chainsaw qualifications and their skills and experience. And it was on that tree where there were so many screw-ups that eventually it, it fell and Andy was in, a, in the wrong place at the wrong time and got, got hit. There's no doubt that his crew members did a great job providing some basic first aid to try to stop bleeding, but, but then things went sour quick because effectively Andy laid there on that hillside for the better part of three and a half hours before they could figure out what to do, yet a road was less than a quarter mile away. Andy had been loaded up into um, litter and he was being moved down the dozer line toward the road in the ambulance. Um, a helicopter had been called, but smoky conditions. Um, couldn't get any of the local helicopters. Um, I guess there was some disagreement on whether to keep moving Andy in the litter or wait on the helicopter. And for whatever reason, the decision was made, wait. hours and 26 minutes. So Wildland Fire has done a great job of responding to fires. And Wildland Fire has figured out how to get the machine moving, to get people, helicopters, engines on site to control that fire, or at least to try to suppress it. We suck at taking care of our people. We have the opportunity, looking at Andy's incident, to learn some really hard lessons as to what it takes and what we have to be prepared for to evacuate somebody such that they have a fair chance at survival. Wildland Fire needs to step up to the plate and recognize that we have a huge gap where we don't have sufficient plans in place and sufficient resources to get somebody to a hospital within an hour of a significant injury. And it's, it's going to take another culture change and advocacy on behalf of a lot of different people to push this issue such that we actually change. My name is Bill Arsenal, and I am the lead paramedic for Jim County Emergency Services. Uh, while working for the Forest Service, I got asked to go to the Bergdorf Fire as a paramedic. And that was really where I saw how dysfunctional the EMS system was for wildland fire. The reality of it is the Forest Service and the BLM and a few of the other agencies are not emergency medical response agencies. They're fire agencies. And if you look at their mission statement, it really hones to that point that they are a fire suppression agency uh, for the protection of natural resources. They're stepping into a world that they're not used to being in. 
emergency medical response. So I used the same concepts that I learned in the military to give those guys in the wildland fire world. I've given them hands-on training, medical. Hey, let's get somebody on a backboard. When's the last time you did it under a stressful environment? Hey, let's take care of somebody's airway. Hey, let's flip a car over and have you get them out of it. We're going to have you do hoist training. We're going to have you do short haul training. These aren't things that normally wildland fire guys do. But when that moment hits, they need to know how to do it. I gave guys an understanding of why a combat tourniquet, why an Israeli dressing, how to use a sked, how to use a traverse rescue stretcher, why this device versus that device. And I put them on YouTube videos. And it's mainly shot crews and hell attack crews and engine crews that are pulling those videos up. Why? Because they're not getting what they need from somebody. And they want that training to take care of their crew member. Nothing was more painful for me as a combat soldier to put a flag draped casket into a helicopter or an airplane and know that some mom, some dad, some wife, some husband wasn't getting their family member back. And that is ultimately what pushed me even further to make sure that these guys could get their brothers and sisters on the fire line home at the end of the day. And I know there are folks at NIFSI who feel the exact same way I do, but bureaucratically their hands are tied. The grassroots effort will continue. Folks can embrace it. They can be a part of it. Our hands aren't tied by the tape. And our hands aren't tied by the policies. But we, at the end of the day, are going to make sure that these wildland firefighters, whether they're federal, whether they're state, whether they're a cooperator, they get what they need to take care of their brothers and sisters. And I know NIFSI's doing their part and the grassroots people are doing their part, but we still have a lot of people who need to be educated on how to do their part. Uh, my name is Anthony Meisner. I am at the Arizona Wildfire Academy in beautiful Prescott, Arizona. We're at Emory Riddle Aeronautical University here in Prescott, Arizona, and uh, this is uh, the twelfth year the academy has been up and running. There's a few of us that got together uh, in the year 2000, something like that, and felt like we needed to provide better fire training for firefighters. Don Howard, one of the founders here, had found, uh, had known Corey Kirkpatrick. Uh, what she brought into the to program was her husband, Eric Marsh, who's the superintendent of the Granite Mountain Hotshots. Everything builds to this week at the Wildfire Academy. All the instructional manuals, all of that stuff. And they were basically running it out of their mobile home in Government Canyon. So they worked a deal with the uh, Emory Riddle Aeronautical University. And uh, it just kind of grew, morphed from that point until it crescendoed really this year with 708 students, uh, you know, 40 plus classes. And the key was educating firefighters. The irony, the sad irony was that, you know, Eric lost his life last year doing what he loved the most. One of the most, other than wildland firefighting was instructing wildland firefighters. I came down to Arizona uh, to take two different classes, uh, S359, which is the medical unit leader class, as well as the fireline medical provider class that they're offering at the academy this year. This is the first year that, that we've offered it here at this academy. I think it's a good thing because a lot of people will come to our medical unit leader class thinking that 
this is a class that's going to teach them how to go out and be a line EMT or a line medic, and it's not. This is a manage ours is a management class. It's been a need. These guys have done a great job getting the curriculum out there, and now we're starting to basically just share information with people and, and tell them this is what the job is, and hopefully that uh, NWCG will adopt it. So, I think it's it's needed. The Sean Foster and the Sedona Fire Department that's developed this class. Um, those guys are out working for fire departments there in the medical field as first responders. Saw the need because they, they cross over between wildland and, and structure, and uh, I think they've hit a home run with it. My name is Jason Coyle, and my role here is I'm a division supervisor that is in charge of a group of classes which include the Fireline Medical Provider class. Um, the Fireline Medical Unit Leader class is something that we began developing last year. There's three different people from, that work with me at the Sonoma Fire District. We started talking about some of the, the, the training needs that paramedics and EMTs that are asked to go out and support the, the, the crews are out there fighting a fire, that some of the, the areas that, that the, the current training was lacking. 10, 15, 20 years ago, there was no such thing as an EMT or even a paramedic uh, on the fire line. If there was a medical incident, it was the crew or the engine's responsibility for getting that person out to the road where the street paramedics could pick them up. The whole idea about uh, fire line medical providers is, is for you know, probably the last seven to ten years, there's been some type of uh, medical providing on the fire line for the firefighters. At first it was a basic EMT type that were integrated into the crews that were working. From there it, uh, it moved into advanced life support, paramedics coming out through different contract companies, and uh, there was really a, not a lot of standard to it. And from what I've read and saw from the medical provider classes, they're starting now to set the parameters and the standard for that medical provider supporting wildland firefighters out on the line. And I see more and more need for the fire line EMT, the fire line uh, medical provider. And this is one of those classes that uh, I think has been needed for way, way many years.